howdy. This is part two of working on the old classic case 580CK. If you haven't seen part one yet, well, that's the beginning of the story. So just a quick review. We discovered that this cylinder had come apart inside. And we took it out of the tractor and we found out that the trunnion pivots there I just put on are worn out too. We've already finished some of the repairs on this cylinder in part one. And so now let's focus on these trunnion pivots. There's the socket. And I don't know if you remember from part one that we've realized that the trunnion shaft flange there has worn down in so bad that it's grinding into the cylinder wall and that's only half as thick as it was when it was new. Nasty. These trunnion bushings are made of very hard steel but they are still very worn out. You can see here the trunnion shaft is worn out and the bushings worn out. Yeah. And this, yeah, it's obvious there's a brand new bushing and an old one and you can see how worn out it is, but check out this other direction where it's fatter. That's crosswise to the cylinder bore and the trunnion shaft that goes in here also wore out in the same way. And check this out. When the trunnion shaft flange was wearing into the bottom of the cylinder, it also wore some of the width of this. It also wore into the top of these trunnion sockets in the cylinder, you could see the damage around the whole rim. For these trunnion shaft flanges, to renew them, this part fits into the frame and that's okay. One of them is a little loose, I might use a thin shim. This is the part that we got to deal with. That's what goes into the bushing and it's worn out bad. So to deal with that, I'm going to build it back up with arc welding and then have a machinist turn it down on a lathe back to the original factory spec. Now the idea here is to rotate this as you are welding for a continuous bead, but you need the ground clamp on it too. And I don't have any other rig than this to get the job done. I'll just have to do it in little short bits. It's kind of loose in the vise and I'll be welding like this and turning it at the same time. When I get to the end, I've got to stop and reset it. The question is, what welder am I going to use? This was the one I showed in part one. It was just a joke. That was my welder. It burned in a wildfire. I haven't the heart to throw it away. It's a 59 Fiat. I made my own governor. It's got 200 amp Lease Neville truck alternators on it. A Kenmore washing machine water pump and the uh, amperage control for welding, military surplus pilot suit heater controls. And when the engine's loafing along at 13, 1400, the alternators are spinning at 3600. Slow and quiet served me well for 30 years. Well, we obviously can't use that. And what's this? This is a loner. It's a 1929 Flathead Dodge 6 throttle control. It's 250 amp DC low and high range on the bottom switch and this is how you adjusted the amperage. What a tank! There's the polarity selector switch, the exciter and the coupler, belt driven governor and an updraft carburetor with no air cleaner. That's how you started it. <laughs> yeah, it runs at uh, 1800 RPMs. Slow and quiet. Deluxe. Yeah, you could say it's got character. Pretty nice. Before I start welding, I want to heat this up first because the hot welding on a cold steel can make hard local places that will be a bummer for the machinist to deal with when he turns it down on a lathe. I'm going to gradually bring it up to about 500 degrees or so. 
Now what we're looking for here is to get continuous overlaps every time I stop and start again and to chip off all slag before I start a new bead. I want to be overlapping all the time so when it's all finished there won't be any voids. Well, at least keep them to a minimum. I'm using 7018 rod. Really like that stuff. So the same overlapping is important when I come around the next time I want to make my new bead overlap partially onto the old bead next to it. And again, all slag chipped off of each weld as I finish it. So it's just go round and round and round until I get to the outside. And I want to build up that edge too. And this is what I end up with. It looks ugly and <laughs> rough. And it is. But the main thing is that there's no places that are too low. Too big spine. The worst thing would be taking it to the machinist, having him turn it down and find out there were places that you didn't build up high enough. So too big and ugly is okay. For the rough part, I'm going to take care of that here with this sander. I've got like a 30 grit in there, I think. Just take all the obvious high places off so that the machinist will not have such a hard time getting started on it. He'll appreciate it. Get it basically smooth. And this end, a couple of them were worn down a little. I just wanted to make sure I got the corner edge built up enough. A final thing to clean up on here is my welding splatter. It's down in these holes. I used a drill bit that was a snug fit and I just ran it in and out of the holes by hand. These other two holes are threaded and they were pretty cruddy so I chased them with a tap. And I also chased this other hole with a tap. This is a grease fitting hole, eighth inch pipe thread tap. And there was some dried grease, so I ran a drill bit down in there by hand and cleaned it all out. I'm about a quarter inch too big, which is an eighth of an inch on a side, which is plenty good enough. So there it is, ready for the lathe work. But what lathe am I going to use? Well, I showed this at the end of part one as a joke, but this really is a lathe and it also got ruined in the wildfire. Decades ago, it was donated and it needed a lot of work. Nine broken gear teeth on two different gears. Most of the bushings were worn out. It was a turret lathe. We found an engine lathe, saddle, lead screw, drive screw, and rack, and made it all fit on there. The ways didn't match, and there was never a compound, as you can see. But we still managed to make it cut threads anyway. You can see here the shims we used to get those lead screw supports to mount up to this body. We made a custom PTO to come out of this six-speed gearbox to power the engine lathe saddle drive screw. Me and a neighbor worked on it for over a year, repaired the broken gear teeth, built up the bushings. We finally got it all together. Only had a four jaw chuck and two of the jaws were left hand threads. Took some getting used to. We even figured out a way to have this thing cut threads, standard threads, with these sprockets, chains, and jack shaft fabricated from scratch using throwaway parts to power the engine lathe's lead screw. With this lathe, we fabricated a lot of stuff from scratch and fixed a lot of local neighbors' broken stuff. I even had it running on my solar electric. Oh yeah! So how did we get these machined down and finished? Well, one of the sons of the man who gave the lathe in the first place did the job when he was way too busy to do it. Even missed his lunch break. He saved time by having me do all the basic setup for each piece. So there wasn't time to dink around with trying to make that final polished finish. But for this job, for this purpose, it's fine. I think they're quite beautiful. I wanted to show here the void from me not getting all the slag off and starting and stopping and not overlapping perfectly 
when I welded these up. When the machinist saw them, he just tried to keep a straight face and said, well, that's the place for the grease. Yeah, 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 yeah. But now back to work. I want to install these new trunnion bushings and I want a 2000s press fit. So I measured the sockets, checking them out, and these sockets are stretched that way too big and they're squished in too narrow that way. So I'm going to try and make them more round again. The cylinders clamped in the vise with the direction that I want to squeeze in, in the jaws. And I want to be careful that I don't have it sitting all the way down because I'd never be able to squeeze it close into the cylinder, only on the round part there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat up both sides that I want to get wider. Get them good and hot. Not red hot, but close to it. That's old grease in there that's liquefying from the heat and burning. And I'm going to clamp down this vise real tight. I actually put a cheater bar on there afterwards to make it even tighter. Now three sockets needed to have this done, so I got some practice in. And it seemed that I had to really increase the heat up and really make the vise tight to finally get it to budge a couple of thousandths, which is almost what I was looking for. I also found out that down at the bottom of the hole, it was more true all along. And it was up at the rim where it was most distorted. The results from this work are that all three sockets are now more round. One of them is a little bit too small though. So we'll deal with that next. I think the reason this ended up being too small is that I got it too close to red hot when it was in the vise. Here I'm mapping it out, seeing what's going on where it's too small, where it's closer to being just right, because I'm going to remove some of the metal. And the proper way would be to do it on a milling machine, but I don't have one, so this is going to be a little hillbilly version of a milling machine. But hey, whatever works. Now I've been doing this kind of stuff for many years, so I've got kind of a feel for it. I would say if I was a beginner, I would just be real cautious. Always keep moving. Always keep checking the measurements. It's better to take off not enough. You can always take off more. What I'm doing is taking off the parts that need it the most, and then I'm going to feather it out lighter into the place that it doesn't need to have as much taken off. And you'll notice I'm not getting all the way down. Like I mentioned before, the bottom of these are more true, and so they don't need as much taking off as the top part. And the bushing with its end bevel doesn't go all the way to the bottom anyway. Some 220 grit sandpaper to just kind of smooth it out a little bit and take the edge off of that rim. Well, it's looking nice and round, and I got about a 2000s press fit, which is a little on the tight side, but I like it. Now, here's an item I picked up that I'm going to use to help repair this socket even better. They are called arbor shims, and they are just very precise flat washers. And I'm going to use them to build back up the rim of these trunnion sockets. They were the bottom trunnions on the tractor and they really wore down, so this is going to bring them back up to original size. The plan is to permanently tack weld these shims on so they become part of the cylinder. But I'm going to do it later, which is going to make what happens next a little harder. Oh well, it's easier to see it in hindsight. Now this socket requires two arbor shims, but this is a different one here, and it only needs one but the same principle applies. You notice it didn't need any grinding out. This was one that came out just right. I just lightly sanded it. Now we're going to heat it up to put in the new bushing. The bushing is in the freezer with a t-shirt getting cold. But while we're waiting for the bushing to get cold in the freezer, let's talk about the colors here going on as this heats up. 
This is ancient knowledge, but a lot of people still don't know about it. On a piece of clean, bare steel, you can tell the temperature of the metal pretty close by the color. And there's a problem here because you start heating up metals that have been heat treated to a certain hardness and you're going to mess it up. Now these cylinder sockets, I don't think that they're anything special. They're pretty soft and malleable, but it's kind of playing with fire. You don't want to get them too hot, but you also need it hot to expand it so that the cold bushing will fall in easily. It's a compromise. A better way would be to use an arbor press and then you wouldn't have to make this get so hot or not need to use any heat at all. But I don't have an arbor press, so I'm just gonna go with this. I've got the frozen bushing right here at hand wrapped up in the frozen t-shirt and it's ready to go in. See the ice cubes on it? Should fall in easy, but I don't want it to fall in easy because it'll drop too far down and then be stuck there. Because I want it to stick out a little so it will be flush with those arbor shims, which is really a drag. So I've got to kind of pull up short. Now it's getting hot and it's getting tighter but I didn't want it to go too far down either. Here I'm checking to see if the arbor shim and the bushing are flush yet. Not quite. Now don't get down on me for being a caveman with my hammer. These bushings are incredibly hard. I've never seen a mushroom dent or crack, but a better, more professional way to pound that in, to be on the safe side would be to use a piece of metal in between or a round drift to pound it in. All right, they're flush. Now here's another situation that I might run into is when I didn't get it in in time and it got hot and it got stuck and I don't want to pound it real hard and I don't have an arbor press. This particular one does not have any shims so the bushing's supposed to sit down in there flush. But what I'm going to do first is cool this whole thing down as cool as I can in the shade or even in a walk-in freezer and then just use the torch around the outside. So just for a few moments, the outside is hotter and bigger than the bushing and I can more easily pound it down. Here's a shot of the two bushings in with their arbor shims. And the final results are in. We're within two thousandths of being a perfect circle. And there's ten thousandths clearance between this bushing and the trunnion shaft. That'll leave five thousandths on a side, which is just about right, enough for the grease. The fit is excellent. There's no extra play in there and it doesn't bind. Oh yeah. Well, I deserve a little break. I'm gonna go outside and stretch a little. Wow, look at that, right over my house. I think those are sandhill cranes. They fly over every fall and spring, but I've never had them fly straight over my head like that. Very cool. Okay, there's one more job I want to do here for this part two segment, and it's related to what we've been doing. So might as well stay on the subject and finish it out. These are the swing cylinder rods. This rod end takes two hardened bushings and it's got the same issues just like the trunnions. Too big, out of round, being bigger that way than that way. 
So the first task is to get them round again. Could do my hillbilly grinder or a milling machine, which would be much better. Afterwards, they will be round, but too big, and we'll make up the space with some shims. But I first wanted to talk about measuring with the caliper I use. It doesn't reach down in far enough for me to realize that this is tapered inside there, so I almost got fooled. But if I had used a real milling machine, I would have discovered this and then it wouldn't have mattered. So after the hole is made round, I found out I needed 14 thousandths worth of shims to get a 2 thousandths press fit. I don't have that, I have two three and a half thousandths shims. Seven thousandths per side, 14 thousandths total. That little cutout is so that I don't block the grease hole coming in. Notice that one bushing has already been put in on the other side, and this shim is going to go all the way down and bump up against it. There's a space between the two bushings and this second shim isn't going to go all the way down. So to help keep it from getting dragged in when I pound the bushing in, I cut these little slits all the way around and bent the top over. This is just standard steel shim stock I found on eBay. You can pick the thickness you want. The ones I got came in six inch wide rolls. But you can also just get a small chunk if that's all you need. The one key important thing is that the shim is cut to the right length. So when it's put in and pushed against the side, the ends butt together with no overlap. To help make this bushing slide past the shim and not drag the shim in with it, I'm going to sand off the edge of this bevel and make it just a bit smoother than the factory had it. See there, I used a 120 grit in my angle sander. Now like we did on the trunnion bushings, I'm going to take this and put it in the freezer and I'm going to heat up this end with a torch. Notice I'm spending more time up by that rod because it's sucking away all the heat. Now once again, like the trunnion, I am going to get the bushing out of the freezer. I'm making sure here that my shims didn't block the grease hole. And burning a screwdriver. As far as color versus heat on a hardened steel piece, that bushing got up to looks like 600 degrees or so and it doesn't seem to affect its hardness at all. I've never noticed that these things stay really hard, but that's not necessarily true on another type of hardened steel. Now it's just a matter of sanding off those little shim tabs, don't need them anymore, and then clean it up and prime it for the paint shop. <laughs> 